we are now doing lofting and numerical control. So I'll uh, just give a brief. We've done basically for your for the other batches uh, how your ship is built in the shipyard, what processes are there. That I'll be doing for you, and how your computer aided design is utilized. That is CAD, and how your computer aided manufacturing is done in the shipyard. Then the various techniques are there, lofting and numerical control and all. And then we'll be doing prefabrication. We have the other processes like nesting and all that I will be explaining to you later because I've already finished. Nesting is how to cut the steel plates uh, without wasting that much. So the wastage is reduced by nesting. Lofting is basically a drafting technique where you are using your lines plan for cutting your steel plates. So basically lofting is how you design, how you basically transfer your lines plan into the actual model like this. So with your lines plan, you're making a 3D design. So that is lofting. Earlier lofting was done in the shipyard loft. So they had templates uh, like these to cut the various board sections and then join them. But nowadays your ships cannot be done like this, so they are done on computer now. After the advent of computers in 1980, this has been utilized. So lofting technique is transferring your lines plan to the actual uh, shape given to the ship's hull. Now lines plan I'll be uh, doing for you the new batch afterwards because I can't explain in two lines that what is lines plan. Take the whole class there. So that I'll explain to you later what is a lines plan. So let me continue with my with the lofting techniques. Now lofting is basically a drafting technique. Now the guys who were doing engineering, they have to do uh, use a drafter for drafting. So like your parallel ruler uh, drafter is basically connected to a point and then you can move it to make your various shapes and designs. Yes. Now we don't use parallel ruler there because uh, that is going to shift. So drafter is basically another thing that you connect to the board to make the shape and uh, there this uh, drafting technique is utilized in computers nowadays. So your drafting technique here is not straight line but curved lines which are generated and which can be used to uh, plan your streamline objects like your bodies of your aircraft or bodies of the ships or bodies of your car. Those all require design. So earlier the lines were made on wood and then the wood was cut for advanced woodworking and nowadays the lines are made on computers and then they are shifted to your CAD and CAM machines for cutting with numerical control. So that was a lofting technique used earlier and for small boards they still use this because they don't have a budget for using computers for making small boards. So lofting uh, basic technique is still used for making small boards. Now this is the lofting technique uh, which is presently used for making ships. So your lines plan if you see these are your orthogonal planes which are cutting your ship's hull and you get a lines plan and that is transferred to make the shape of your hull. So those curved lines are utilized making the shape of the hull. So the technique can be as simple as bending a flexible object like a long strip of uh, thin wood or thin plastic and it is passed over three non-linear points. Now the thing is these points are not linear because they are not in a straight line. They are in curved lines. So this is non-linear points. And scribing the resultant curved line 
and is as elaborate as plotting the line using computers or mathematical tables. So lofting is particularly useful in board, board building and is used for draw and cut the pieces of hull and keel. So the lines are usually curved and often in 3D. So the loftmen are the mold loft at the shipyard, which was earlier done. They're responsible for taking the dimensions and details from your lines plan and drawings and translating this into templates, patterns, ordinates, cutting sketches, profile, margins, other data. And from 1970 or onwards, you had computed a design, which is normal for shipbuilding design and lofting process. I'll be showing you a video on that so that you can understand it better. So lofting is transfer of lines plan to a full-sized plan of the ship. So it assists, it assures that your ship will be accurate in its layout and the pleasing in appearance. So there are many methods to loft a set of plans. Plans which were earlier done uh, were lofted on level wooden floor, make, marking heavy paper such as red rosin to full size plan or directly on plywood sheets. And then you should use to cut the sections for the board. So this was the process, if you know the caps they're wearing, that this was in 1930, 1940, these kind of caps, golf caps were used. This is around that kind of photograph. Now what is numerical control? So numerical control is basically using binary numbers 0 and 1 for cutting process. So the process of manufacturing the various parts of the hull which may be bounded by ship side, that is your DB, or double bottom, the bracket, the bulkhead, the web frame, the stringer plating, they can all be automated and controlled by means of computer generated information. So numerical control machines in use, the shipbuilding include automatic drafting machines, several varieties of uh, numerical control, flame cutting machines, and associated computer programs. And also an NC frame bending machine or numerical control frame bending machine. So the computer numerical control machining is a process used primarily for manufacture of machine parts, products, and items. Now these CNC machines are the latest machines because they utilize computer numerical control over machine tools like lathes, routers grinders or mills and computer numer uh, numerical control is different from typical pcs because the software here is used as a special one or customized for g code so basically the code here is g code which is not in the normal computers so the specific cnc machine language that allows precise control of features like speed location coordination feed rate so that this, drive, this uh, specialized software drives a computerized machinery and this language G-code enables the precise control of coordination, feed rate, location and speed amongst other factors. Now this is your CNC machine. So this is a late machine which is numerically controlled. So this is all computerized, you don't have to do manually. The cutting, the depth, everything will be controlled by these machines. So here you see not, not many people are involved here, only one person involved for operating it. So CNC machines can automate jobs that require several cuts, a router or spindle cutting the implement, which usually resembles a drill bit. So a true drill bit cuts only at the tip, while nearly all the router bit cuts the material. So the programming in CNC machines incorporates all the exacting high speed movements needed to produce the object. And therefore, you can have the detailed customization of this process. Now, what are the advantages of this machining? In using uh, CNC machines, you are having precision components. So, you'll have a digital template, autonomous machining of CNC to eliminate any human error. So you'll not make an error using this machine. Second advantage is 
that these have reliable endurance. So they can work around the clock at weekends and holidays and only stop when needed to maintain or repair. Third advantage of CNC machines is high production scalability because uh, it can give, uh, give you voluminous cargo. So voluminous products can be produced. And once your design parameters and specifications have been entered into the machine, you can execute huge quantities and afford flexible scalability. Scalability means volume can be created. So here you have more capability because when used in tandem with advanced design software, these machines create outputs that cannot be replicated by manual machines. So these are the modern machines. So your labor is also less as an advantage. So for your labor cost is reduced. Your uniform product is there because you will not have any changes due to error or human error. When you choose this kind of machine, your output will match exactly what you feed in. The costs are lower because of high speed, efficiency, and specialization and precision. And fewer labor hours, you can have fewer, less cost. Headache is less because your human element is reduced. Better safety because, again, the human element is reduced. Design retention is there because a, a perfect pr prototype can be created of whatever design you feed in, and that design can be retrieved later. The maintenance is low, so your G code software automatically updates itself. So the CNC machine does, does not require much service or maintenance. They are versatile because they can create any component you can imagine, but you have to feed in the data. Now, what are the disadvantages of CNC machines? They are expensive because uh, the automation and all software there, so they are expensive, but in long term, the efficiency, client retention, reputation of quality and reliability is going to make that better for the owner of this machine. Now, the thing is, this second disadvantage is makes your manual labor obsolete. Because uh, your skills of manual labor are not utilized there. So here you can have unemployment and it can make your manual skills obsolete. And while CNC machines are created tremendous new opportunities of business, they are creating unemployment. So I'll just show you a video on lofting and CAD CAM applications in shipping.
There's a pattern to genius. There's a method behind the magic. I always tell people my inspiration was my desperation. Now I'm just sharpening up a pencil here because I'm just about to draw the total boat sport dory on a drawing board. But before I get involved with that, I'd kind of like to show you numbers of sets of plans that I've been looking at. And it's been helping me make some decisions about what I'd like to do with my dory. You know, it's nothing, you know, wrong with these plans or anything, but everybody's an individual and I'm going to do things the way I want to do them. And, uh, I don't want a big dory. We're going to build kind of a small dory so that it can be handled by one man. But like I say, before we get involved in drawing it, which would be the first video of a 36 video series on the building of that boat, I'd kind of like to first show you some of these plans and show you kind of where I get some of my ideas and uh, my thought pattern on what's made me decide to design the dory that I'm going to build. Now, that dory has been designed already really in my head. So all I have to do is really put it on paper and then build it. So let's take a look at some of these plans right here. Now, like I said, we've got numbers of sets of drawings in front of us here of different dories. And uh, we've blown them all up to a certain size. They're all the same size. Uh, they fit the one inch to the foot scale right now. We had to do that really with a photo and larger. But... Uh, We've got it accomplished, and here they are. They're all on the same scale. And it's funny because when you look at draw lines drawings like this, you can tell that all these dories, uh, even though they're all dories and all referred to really as Swampskip-style dories, they're all different shapes. 
They're different lengths, different widths. They've got different shear lines, different rocker to the bottom. All kinds of things are different. The way they're playing. Let me just show you the other one. This is a Neant dory, which was the standard dory for the U.S. This point of the shear is either right at the middle or like the first one, the lowest point in the shear is just about the angle of the dead rise, the first couple planks that are on the boat, and whether the dead rise lines up with some of the planks that are in radius at the top side. You know, so, uh, you know, the seat's in it, so you, you can't get confused. You don't know what the bow or the stern is. Now, what we have here is a little Swampskit Dory tender. Planks are in a radius. So I wanted to figure out where the center of that radius would be. The first thing that I actually did was draw a straight line across the top. Radius was, and I drew the line from the shear right straight across, and I tried to put my set of dividers. Use that for reference, and uh, basically flat actually is very easily and I've drawn the line across and then I set my dividers on that line and uh, basically kind of fill in until these videos get released we're working on a little Harris Shaw sailboat right over here I've got a little v-bottom model right here in front of me of a v-bottom skiff that I designed that's become uh, very interesting to a lot of people. I think I've got a couple of orders for these V-bottoms.
ब्लेस्ड टू ज्वाइन अरविंद सूट क्लासेस सर ने बोला था कि तीन दिन में आपका ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन हो जाएगा एंड इट्स रियली वेरी ट्रू कि तीन दिन के बाद मैं एग्जैक्टली बहुत ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन फील कर रही हूँ आई एम विथ अ न्यू लाइन ऑल टूगेदर इन माई लाइफ I'm here in the Onsroot assembly facility standing on a 40 foot long by 10 foot wide CNC router. And before this thing ships, we wanted to give you guys the inside scoop as to what this machine was built for as well as some of its key features. Let's go have a look. For starters, let's talk about this massive two-piece frame design weighing in at just around 26,000 pounds. Now, just like all Onsroot frames, this thing was designed, fabricated, machined painted and assembled right here in Onsroot HQ. And its two-piece design is what allows us to ship it very easily down to its home in Florida. Now that we talked about the frame, how big it is, how robust it is, let's go talk about the power that drives this machine. As you know, no Onsroot build is complete without Fanuc controls, Fanuc servo motors, and high performance, high RPM spindle. And this machine is no exception. We have Fanuc servo motors in both the X and the U axis as well as a 24 horsepower spindle. Some of you may be wondering what types of industries require a 40 foot long by 10 foot wide three axis CNC router. We commonly sell this size of machine into the RV industry, aerospace industry, as well as the ship building industry. This particular machine will be going down to Florida to St. John's Shipbuilding, where it will be used to process large format materials for offshore supply vessels, barges, tankers, as well as ferries. Thank you for joining us for this episode of On Route HQ. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell button at the top to be notified when our next episode releases. This advanced cruise ship is a luxury hotel on the high seas. Here's an LNG tanker. It can carry enough gas to supply 200,000 households for a year. And this is a car carrier ship that can hold 8,000 cars. These ships and a huge variety of others are made in Japan, a shipbuilding superpower. Welcome to begin. 
Japanology. She's a hub of Japan's maritime trade and she's civil. Let's take a look at the sort of ships that are built here. Japan is a shipbuilding superpower. In one year, it constructs ships totaling 20 million tons. About one-fifth of all the world's ships are made in Japan. From ferries and high-speed ships essential to an island nation like Japan, to freighters and tankers, Japan prides itself on building cost-effective ships of all types and sizes. Let's look at some leading examples. First, a car carrier, used to export motor vehicles. The cars are parked just 10 cents. Specially trained drivers load the vehicles with almost superhuman precision. The largest class of car carrier can fit around 8,000 passenger cars. Next, we have oil tankers, which carry the crude oil essential to... Imabari by the Seto Inland Sea in Ehime Prefecture is one of the largest centers of shipbuilding in Japan. A giant ship like an oil tanker is assembled out of several blocks. Factories build each block and then the blocks are assembled in a dock connected to the sea. This efficient method of shipbuilding called block construction was developed in Japan. This is the manufacturing line for steel plates that will become the ship's hull. Gas torches are cutting the plates in shapes specified by the blueprints. A 300,000 ton tanker is built from around 100,000 steel parts, weighing in at 35,000 tons. The heats the steel plate, causing it to expand. Water is sprayed on and causes the plate to cool and contract. The welds on a single oil tanker measure about 950 kilometers. In welding too, Japanese craftsmen boast world-class skills. This is the bridge, containing the ship's control room. It's being outfitted with wiring and equipment. The completed bridge is lifted to the dock by a crane. Once the bridge is attached, the ship is nearly complete. From the beginning of block building to its completion, this giant tanker took only six months. State-of-the-art technology and superb industrial craftsmanship power the success of Japanese shipbuilding. I'm in a shipyard now in Chiba Prefecture and there's some big steel plates here which are being bent using the techniques that we've just seen in the video. I'm going to be talking to one of the men who works here, Mr. Takashi Hirao. He's going to hopefully clue me in on what's going on here. We're now making a 300,000 ton tanker. Wow, it's a big one. Uh, can you explain what's going on? What, what are these big steel frames here on top of this plate? These are bending templates. The plates are bent according to the curvature of these templates. This one, for example, takes a worker about 12 hours to bend. You can see that these, this thing is curved in different degrees in different parts. So it, if somebody has bent a plate too far and it then needs to be corrected, how would you go about that, for example? If a plate has been bent too far, you can heat it from the underside like that and bend it back into shape. Roughly how long does it take for somebody to master 
Generally speaking, 10 to 15 years. Here we're seeing a block being assembled. This one's going to be part of a 170,000 ton bulk carrier. And there'll be about approximately 200 of these blocks making up the whole ship. This one is part of the engine room and we're seeing some pipes being installed over there. Normally those pipes would be up at the top so the worker would be having to look up to install them. But because it's done in this block style, they can turn the whole thing around so it's easier for the worker to put them in. And then after it's all finished, they can turn it 180 degrees around to install into the ship. Pretty nifty. There was a worldwide revolution in shipbuilding, from wood to iron, and from sail to steam. A parade of new ships, powered by paddle wheels and propellers, took to the seas. Japan joined this global revolution. Not to be outdone by Western powers, Japan invested heavily in shipbuilding, especially the construction of warships. By the 1930s, Japan took its place among the shipbuilding powers and eventually built the Yamato, the largest warship of called the Majors. Japan had no choice but to purchase from them at high prices. It was then that the engineers noticed that some parts of the ship were in the sun, while others were in the shade. 